My, uh, uh, my first experience in dealing with an enemy was in Vietnam. I got orders to go to Okinawa. Mm -hmm. I was in the shower, took a shower, checking in three days, yeah. going out to the field for four more days. And then on the seventh day, we came back in and we're in the shower. And then my platoon sergeant comes in, he says, Lance Corporal signs, he said, pack your trash, you're going to Vietnam. And I was shocked that it was like that. And I was just out of boot camp. I just, just knew, I had no clue. All I knew was if I do what the corporal says, I stay alive. So what happened is they handpicked only the guys that had not been over in Vietnam yet. So I was one of those. They uh, flew us from Fatima Air Base to, uh, o, uh, to Okinawa. Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Let me back up here. Fatima Air Base was on Okinawa. So we went to, to Fatima. We loaded C-130s. Those were big, big, huge planes. And we they flew us to Subic Bay in the Philippines. And we landed in QB Point. From there, we loaded aboard Navy ships. I was on the LPD, the Duluth. And we, it took us three days to sail to Vietnam. We were sitting outside where, uh, Sa where Saigon is. Then they transferred us from that Navy vessel to a merchant marine vessel, which is uh, one of these uh, big long ships that have the big re refrigeration units. And they have they're all different compartments, but they're big. Mm -hmm. There was there was no the freezers were not on or anything like that. It it was structured by letters A B C. So each compartment had a letter. And then what what happened is the uh, refugees were escaping. They were escaping by boats. We were using helicopters to bring them over drop them off, and then fly back, get some more. Some of the uh, good guys of the, the Vietnamese were pilots. What they would do is they would land on the ship, they'd get off, the, the Navy would strip the, the aircraft, and then they'd push the helicopter off the ship into the ocean. And there were so many helicopters and not enough ships. What they did is they would take the helicopter and they would ditch it into the ocean. And then they would pop, after every, everything stopped, they'd pop up out of the water. And then the Navy had little small boats, would go out, motor motor boats, go out there and pick them up and bring them back to the ships. I was on the USS American Racer. That was the name of the ship. And what we were responsible for was guarding the superstructure of the ship. Uh, it was, the operation was called Frequent Wind. And what we were doing was we were evacuating uh, what was left of Saigon. So we were bringing uh, the embassy personnel and uh, a lot of the refugees, bringing them aboard these ships and bringing them, uh, we floated three days back to Subic Bay. They gave us a night of R&R because we were tired and all of that. Um, and then the next morning, we went back and got on the ship and then we went to Guam and turned them over to the Army. And then they put us back on C-130s and flew back to Okinawa. Yeah. 
when we got back to Okinawa, they searched all our gear and all that to make sure we did, weren't bringing back contraband, you know, weapons that we weren't supposed to have. So that was a very short stint. It only was uh, very quick. It was get in and get out. Uh, a lot of them, they were shelling us. They were doing fi they were enemy fire, small arms, uh, mortars. So we're, we had a job that we had to do, and we got it done. Once that was accomplished, then it was over. Now, the next time I got involved in combat, I was I had just finished drill instructor duty, and I joined Alpha Company, First Battalion, First Marines, and they uh, grabbed us all. And it was December of 1990, and we. Uh, Packed up all our gear and then went to March Air Force Base, loaded 747s, weapons and all, packs, the whole thing, and then they flew us to Saudi Arabia. And then we took buses to what they called the Defense Secure Area. And that, that was like a tent city. And that's where we stayed for a week where we got the desert cam camouflage uniforms, the helmet liners, the whole, the whole wax, ammunition, everything that we needed. After a week, we started moving forward. Uh, every week we moved forward and closer and closer to Kuwait. And uh, the thing that uh, you need to know is that the Marines don't get what the other services get. Like the Army, they had backhoes, they had all kinds of some bulldozers to build their bunkers. We had pick and shovels. And so we would, it would take us a whole day to dig a bunker and then use it for a couple of days and then we'd be moving forward again. So once we, once we uh, got closer to the Kuwaiti border, that's where we stayed and waited for the ground war to start. On the 17th of January is when the air war started. They woke, they woke us up about 3.30 in the morning and the whole sky was just black except for flashing lights. Those were the bombers. And they came over our heads and we watched them as they went towards Kuwait. When they got to Kuwait, the lights went out from the aircraft. So it was pitch black. And then about 15 minutes later, all you saw was flashes, flashes, and then you, the ground would shake, and then you'd hear the boom. There, were, when we went on patrol, when we got actually started the war, the craters from those bombers were as deep as two, three stories deep. They were using 500-pound bombs, 1,000-pound bombs. And then, and then they were saturating and cutting off the supply lines to the bad guys, to the Iraqis.